Summer reading is in full swing. Visit summerreading.queenslibrary.org for our full summer reading program schedule, book list for all ages, and other resources to keep your kids engaged and learning all summer long. Plus, don't forget to participate in our reading challenge and social media sweepstakes for a chance to win some cool prizes. Queens Public Library, along with the New York City Department of Education, will be providing free lunches for all children under 18 throughout the summertime. Summer meals will be offered Monday to Friday from 1 to 2 p.m. through August 31st. Enrollment is not required and there is no cost. For more information and a list of participating libraries, visit queenslibrary.org. Back to School is around the corner. Visit queenslibrary.org to see all of our back to school programs and giveaways and to read our guide with helpful tips on family communication, book lists, and more. Welcome to Wellness Wednesdays. I'm Christopher Galarza, Queens Public Library's Community Health Educator. Today, we welcome back Sharice Francis for our monthly workshop series where we will read and discuss excerpts from essays and generate written work based on prompts inspired by the memoir anthology, You Are Your Best Thing, Vulnerability, Shame, Resilience, and the Black Experience, edited by Tarana Burke and Brene Brown. Based on the quotation from Toni Morrison's Beloved, how can we see ourselves as our own best thing? How does living in our truth give us the breathing room to be our full selves? We will be deep diving into various themes like vulnerability, family, healing, spirituality, social and institutional oppressions, art and memory. Please welcome Sharice Francis and Sharice, please take it away. Thank you, Christopher, and welcome back everyone. Uh, welcome back to the You Are Your Best Thing series. Today, we're going to be talking about families and fictive kin. So many of you may know the quote, blood is thicker than water, and you may have a common interpretation of that quote. But what you might not know is that the quote is not the original way of saying it. Blood is thicker than water is actually the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. So the original meaning of that quote is that the family you choose is stronger than the one you're born to. That it's not enough for blood relatives to be considered family, but that deep connections we make with people, whether they're blood relatives or not, is what truly makes family. So in thinking of that quote, I want us to read a little bit from uh, Jason Reynolds' essay in the anthology, Between Us, Re A Reckoning with My Mother. And then we'll talk a little bit more about fictive kin afterwards. My mother would tell me stories about growing up in a no spotlight town on 200 acres of land acquired by her great great grandfather, who was a freedman. How his chosen name after emancipation was January, and how no one actually knew how he got the land, but everyone believed he somehow inherited it from the family who formerly owned him. He built a house on this acreage but he only knew of two types of homes, slave quarters and the big house. And to build slave quarters was out of the question. So he built a house resembling the one of the family who had treated him as property. And he tilled the soil and planted vegetables, grew fruit trees, had hogs and chickens. He got married and raised children. One of those children, John Wesley, would inherit January's green thumb, making him the heir to the land. 
And as John Wesley grew older, he would eventually informally adopt his grandson, my grandfather, whose mother had abandoned him for a life in the North. John Wesley raised my grandfather as his own, taught him how to reap and sow, taught him the value of hard work and heredity, taught him family. When John Wesley died, he left the land and the house in my grandfather's care. And that's where my mother was born and where she lived until she was 10 years old. It's where she learned to snap peas and pick cotton and pluck chickens. It's where she learned as the middle child how to take care of her older and younger sisters, the independent and dependable compass of a sometimes wayward siblinghood where she too would learn family. So in that excerpt from uh, Jason Reynolds' essay, um, I feel that he gave two different meanings of fictive kin. And so I wanna to present to you two definitions of fictive kin. The first one is the more, more common one that we know of that a uh, fictive kin is a kinship based on social agreements such as friendship instead of adoption, blood, or marriage that creates a relationship like family. And in that section, we read about how Reynolds' grandfather was adopted informally um, by um, Wesley and became part of his family. And it wasn't a formal agreement, he just took him in and this definition of fictive kin has been extremely important for marginalized groups of people. As we just read, um, Wesley was a formerly enslaved Black person. And for Black people, Indigenous people, and people of color, uh, fictive kin has been important when um, slavery or even immigration will separate original families. And so you have to rely on extended families or other community members to help take care of um, each other. And um, fictive kin has also been important for LGBTQIA communities as well, when um, it's hard to rely on blood relatives who may not be accepting of who you are. So fictive kin is often described as a family of choice. Sometimes people do formal kind of events and um, rituals to kind of establish that kind of kinship, such as when uh, people choose godparents for their child. And another term that can be used for fictive kin is called alloparenting. And alloparenting is when you rely on someone who's not a biological parent to help raise children. And one of the common quotes is, it takes a village to raise a child. Another definition of fictive kin that I uh, made for myself is family storytelling. As Reynolds describes in that section, his mother constantly tells him stories. And I feel like that part of kinship is something that needs to be talked about more, how storytelling is part of how we develop deep bonds between each other. And in the original quote for blood is thicker than water, it talked about the blood of the covenant. So I looked up the definition of covenant and covenant is a binding agreement between people. And I looked up what an agreement is, and it's harmony of opinion, action, character, or feeling, a concord, or to be on one accord. So stories are a way for us to kind of harmonize a sense of understanding and feeling between people. So for the importance of storytelling when it comes to family, I found this from the University of Nevada and family story, family storytelling and the benefits for children. A study about family storytelling found that family stories provide a sense of identity through time and help children understand who they are in the world. 
Researchers found that when parents share family stories, children tend to view their family as stronger, their self-esteem was higher, they showed lower levels of anxiety or nervousness, they had fewer behavior problems, and they were better able to deal with effects of stress. Studies show that when parents use more details and emotions when talking about past everyday events called elaborative reminiscing, reminiscing with their preschool age children, the children told more detailed and coherent narratives one to two years later. These children also demonstrated a better understanding of other people's thoughts and emotions. Family reminiscing when families talk about their past experiences together creates a shared history and helps maintain emotional bonds within the family. So as you can see, storytelling is important for our emotional and cognitive development. And the earlier that you start with kids with storytelling, it helps them to acclimate better to the world around them. And in thinking about um, the biological effects in another article called Storytelling Increases Oxyto Oxytocin and Lowers Cortisol, uh, Dr. Robin Fivush talked about how um, these children um, did riddle games and storytelling games and through those games, their cortisol levels, which are associated with stress, lowered, and their oxytocin levels, which are associated with feelings of love and empathy and how humans bond together, um, increased. And so it even within our own bodies, with our hormones, storytelling can have a physical effect on us. And so, as I mentioned, storytelling is important for our emotional bonds and wellness. And this is from another article called Who, we, Who Are We But the Stories We Tell, Family Stories and Healing. And it talks about more about how families narrating stories is important for us to share our emotional experiences, the best and worst life experiences. And in that way, we pass down a heritage of remembrances from one generation to the next. And they talk about more how um, storytelling can also help with severe trauma that can happen because it's a safe space for people to express those deep, complicated emotions with each other. And through that expression can begin to develop the healing process as well. So in thinking about the excerpt we read from Reynolds, as well as um, some of the quotes we read from different uh, theorists and scientists, I um, created a series of questions that you can respond to. What is your definition of family? As Reynolds talked about in his essay, he was able to learn what family meant from his grandfather and his mother. Um, who do you choose as your family? Much in the same way that his grandfather was chosen by Wesley. Who taught you the meaning of family? And what is at least one family story that binds you all together? And you can see a, a meme on the, the side from the sociology student sheet, realizing you likely have more fictive kin than real kin. So I'm gonna give you a few minutes to think about the questions and begin to write down some notes for yourself. And then we'll continue with another excerpt from Reynolds' essay.
Okay. So I hope you were able to write a little bit based on at least one question that's here. And let's continue with Reynolds' essay. We'd gotten to know our cousins, trained our ears to decipher their drawls, and most important, were introduced to a part of our grandfather we'd never known. We'd only known a city man, but down south, we gotten to know a farmer, a giant who walked the rows, who sprinkled seas and steered a tractor, a man who smashed melon on the ground and clawed the heart of it with his bare hands and passed it around to my bro brother and me like communion hosts. There was a tenderness to him, a different kind of tenderness, but a tenderness all the same. He wasn't one for hugs and kisses, but was always sure to thank his children and grandchildren for, for coming to see him. I know y'all busy with your own lives and you don't have to think about me and your mother down here, he'd say. You're my father, my mother would reply, and you'd raise us to always put family first. Then he'd pull a $5 bill from his wallet, press it into my palm as if it were a nugget of gold and say, split that with your brother. And when I'd complain about how ridiculous that seemed, seeing as I'd surely blow half of my share on peanut M&Ms on the way home, he'd say, don't matter, y'all brothers, family. I was 17 when my mother was diagnosed with cancer. In her bladder, caught it early enough, they said. It had eaten away at part of her before she ever told me. But when she did, sitting across from each other at the kitchen table, I could see the bite marks, could see the fear in her eyes. Don't worry, she said. I'm gonna make it because I need to see you make something of yourself. I ain't going nowhere until then. So I wanted to present uh, another aspect of the importance of storytelling with families, and that is collective memory and family and personal stories. And I shared this quote from a Hasidic proverb, give people a fact or an idea and you enlighten their minds, tell them a story and you touch their souls. And as I mentioned before, stories are packed with information, including information about our feelings. And that helps us to have a greater understanding with each other and help us to develop our own sense of ourself, our identity, and also help to regulate our emotions. And also since um, Reynolds mentions his grandfather and how um, going down south because his family, his mom and him had moved up north, meeting his grandfather, he got to have a different sense of who he was and um, a deeper understanding of him. And that also brings up the importance of intergenerational narratives, especially in the times that we live in where we, we seem to have these generational wars between boomers, Gen Xers, millennials, and Gen Zers, where we kind of are in our own echo chambers and not actually listening to one another. I wanna stress the importance of intergenerational um, narratives. And this is from Robin Fivlish again, and Widad Zaman. Intergenerational narratives create meaning beyond the individual and provide a sense of self through historical time and in relation to family members, and thus may facilitate positive identity and well-being, especially during adolescence when issues of identity and emotional regulation become critical developmental tasks, intergenerational narratives may be related to emotional well-being. And this is a, another quote from Robin Fivush. And intriguingly, from the moment of birth, children are surrounded by stories about themselves and their families. Thus, autobiographical narratives are situated in larger social and cultural narratives. We understand personal experiences through the experiences of others. 
one critical fil filter through which personal experiences are understood are intergenerational narratives. Although not well defined in, liter in the literature, the concept of intergenerational narratives refers to the various types of stories families tell about previous genera generations, such as stories of the experiences of grandparents and parents before the child was born. Intergenerational narratives create meaning beyond the individual and provide a sense of self through historical time and in relation to family members, and thus may facilitate positive identity and well-being. So as Fabush and Zaman talk about here, intergenerational stories aren't just important for your own personal um, development and identity, it's also important for social and community wellness, as well as historical wellness. And one example I can think of is I recently read an article from a Tunisian uh, artist named Miriam Bahia Afroui, who talked about um, having uh, regular conversations with uh, her uncle about the Tunisian independence and how in talking with her uncle, she learned a lot about how the Tunisians viewed their independence from France versus how France's official document of Tunisian independence had a specific date that the Tunisians themselves didn't agree with. They felt their independence began long before the official date that France had. And so in learning that from her uncle, she developed a, a stronger bond with her uncle and her family, but also developed a stronger cultural bond as well and gained a wider understanding of Tunisian history and the history of uh, North Africa beyond um, Western constructions of the area. So in thinking about collective memory, family, and your own personal stories, uh, three questions I came up with are, what are some things you want to know from your family members? What did you not know about your family before you f that you didn't f um, know about recently, that you only found out recently? What stories do you want to tell for your own self and for your family? I'll give you a few minutes to think about that, and then we'll return to Reynolds' essay.
Okay. So I hope you were able to write a few responses to the questions. And I will continue reading from Reynolds' essay. So I was thrust into adulthood with a ferocity that seemed unfair and unforgiving. Struggling with college classes, working a boring but paid internship, then going to the hospital to check on my mother who was in and out of surgery, chemotherapy and radiation. I don't remember the daily ride to the hospital and honestly, I don't remember the hospital either, but I do remember seeing just her head lifted above the horizon line of white sheets. Her skin ashen and cracked, tubes beeping and a spot of moisture always in the corner of her eyes. She'd squeeze my hand and nod just enough to let me know she knew I was there. When I'd leave the hospital, I'd return to my hot box of a dorm room where I'd write for hours. Those lyrics I grew up listening to, the rappers and crooners, and somehow through some backdoor miracle transmuted into a love of poetry. So every moment I wasn't in class, at work, or in the hospital, I'd be scribbling well-intentioned self-righteousness to be recited aloud at open mics. It became both a thirst and a therapy, on one hand stretching a hole wider and on the other smearing salve on a wound. But I look back now and I wonder how much of it had to do with the weight of family complications and how much of it was my brother was what my brother had, the affliction of adolescence, the natural irritation of growing up, let alone growing up black. Either way, if it's true that you are what you do most, then over time the writing thing started to crystallize. It started to take hold. And as it did, my mother's cancer started to let go, easing its grip on her life. I remember the doctor explaining to me the dressing on my mother's wound. There was things that in her that had been extracted, parts of her no longer. She'd been turned into something else, but she made it, which gave me the permission to leave. I graduated, packed a trash bag with clothes, jumped in a U-Haul with my college roommate, also named Jason, and headed to New York City to chase my dream of, becoming a, of be being a writer an unavoidable cliche. I'll spare you the details of the mattress on the floor and the 40 ounce beers for dinner. What's more important to note is that six months into my life in Brooklyn, I landed a literary agent, which was at the time felt like hitting the numbers. Like my mother always said, sometimes out of town lottery feels luckier. But the thing about luck is I was 22. I was 22 when my mother was admitted to the hospital again, this time for vomiting and belly pain. Because of the previous surgeries necessary to remove the cancer and the constant cutting into her abdomen, an immense amount of scar tissue had formed and somehow wrapped itself around her small intestine, pinching it, blocking everything from passing through. To correct it meant risking her life. A 12-hour surgery where any mistake could puncture the intestines and sepsis could bring on an infection and she could, according to the doctors, wouldn't survive. I boarded a Greyhound a, at Port Authority and took the four and a half hour ride from New York City to DC to ensure the oak tree of this version of our family could sustain after losing bits of its bark. The trip seemed nothing like our rides down south when I was younger. No turkey sandwiches, no M&Ms, no nab nabs. Headphones took the place of a car speaker blaring Sam Cooke. And there was a man sitting next to me taking up more space than should be legal, more space than Alan ever did. Also, a baby was crying. Also, the bathroom had an encyclopedia of excre excrement strewn across its surfaces. Someone was sick. There was no stories being told, so I told them to myself. Told myself tales about how I'd willed myself into this position, how I'd bootstrapped and hoofed from city to city, stage to stage, a troubled troubadour who had taken the hard road and now it was finally paying off. 
See, while I was going to be with my mother the day before her surgery, I never planned to stay. The trip was going to be down and back, a quick turnaround, because the day of the surgery was also the day I was supposed to sign my first publishing contract, the day my dream was to come true. I was 22 when I met myself. I don't remember much about the night before, about getting off the bus or who picked me up from the station. I don't even remember how I got to the hospital the next day, the next morning. Maybe I rode with her, maybe my mother was already there and I rode with my aunt. What I do remember is just after the doctors prepped my mother for surgery, just before wheeling her down to the operation room, I was able to stand at her bedside. Her face bare, the gold teardrops earrings she wore every day absent as was the red lipstick. Ma, I want to be here, but today is the day I signed the deal. This is it what I've been working for. Black boys don't get this kind of shot. This is my purpose, my dream. I said, salivating at the thought of success. She nodded, told me to do what I needed to do. I kissed her on her forehead and was gone. At 22 years old, I left my mother in a potentially fatal surgery so I could do what could have been done a day, a week, even a month later. But I thought about how I'd never seen black writers growing up. So there, couldn't have been many. And if I didn't do it then, they'd retract the opportunity and I never get to see who I might become. Instead, I got to see who I already was. I'm 36 now. My mother and I have been talk have never talked about the intricacies of that surgery. And whenever I asked about it, she brushes it off. But I know what happened. I know things got shaky, that there were moments when her life teetered, but she made it again. And today, as I write this, she turns 75 years old. This morning, before sitting at my computer, I called her. We talked about how proud we are of each other and how our lives together have been nothing short of miraculous. I told her I was working on this essay and about the shame I carried for over a decade. It sat heavy in me like a dumbbell in my belly, dragged me like laces too long, an infection, something nasty spreading throughout my body. That was a long time ago, she said. I know, but I, sometimes I still feel it, I said. Baby, you got to forgive yourself, she said, and went on to talk about how she raised me to go get what I desire, to, be, to go be who I wanted to be, to simultaneously live a grounded life, a centered life, and a life in flight. But above all, I taught you, like my daddy taught me, family first. Right, and that's the reason I and you've done that every day since. Why be ashamed of what you atone for? Once again, she was the independent, dependable compass pointing true north. And in that moment, this moment, I realized that perhaps I've scratched at the emotional laceration of shame, of selfishness. But if my mother is right, the itching isn't coming from infection anymore. It's coming from the fact I've never removed the dressing from the wound. You understand what I'm saying to you, son? She asks. I think so. Well, let me make it plain. Some things are meant to stay between us, but this ain't one of them. We talked for a few minutes between tears and laughter until I finally I had to go. Happy birthday, Ma. Thank you, baby. And thank you for calling me. I know you're busy with your own life and you don't have to think about me, so I'm grateful when you do. Of course, I chuckled. You're my mother. So in that last uh, section of Reynolds' essay, um, you can see the close bond he has with his mother and how influential she was and is to him becoming a storyteller and writer himself. He is now uh, an award-winning author of novels and poetry books for young adults and uh, middle school children. And in, in this part of the uh, story, you see how him dealing with um, his mother's cancer um, forced him to grow up in new ways, but it also forced him to become the storyteller that he is now and develop a sense of agency uh, for his own life. And I wanted to um, use this quote from, again, Robin Fivush as 
a kind of reflection on this section uh, and thinking about the recognition of the self as a co-creator in the family story. Much of my family interaction focuses on telling family story, on telling family stories. In everyday interactions over the dinner table, in the car, across the television, dialogue, and in more formal ritualized interactions at holiday dinners, family reunions, weddings, and funerals, family members engage in co-constructing the events they have shared together in the past. The way, way in which individual family members participate in the recreation of the family shared past modulates an evolving self-understanding both as an individual as, and as a member of the family. More specifically, families that are able to talk about emotionally complex and difficult events in more open, integrated, and coherent ways may help provide children with the resources to cope with and resolve adversive experiences. So this quote from Fivosh and Jennifer Bohanek, Rachel Robertson, and Marshall Duke um, really highlights for me this section of Reynolds' um, essay and thinking about how um, uh, Reynolds' ability to write stories and um, and write poetry, as he mentioned, helped him cope with a lot of the difficult feelings he was going through at the time. And also his conversations with his mother helped him to deal with a lot of the guilt emotions he felt, where he felt like he was abandoning his mother and leaving her behind. And instead she comforted him and he was allowed to um, have the emotional feedback he needed to be okay with his own feelings through those conversations with his mother. So in, that, in those conversations and those storytelling between um, his family members, he develops a sense of agency for his own life and also realizes how he can take the stories that he's inherited from his mother, from his grandfather, from the rest of his larger extended family, that he can take those stories and create his own stories and his own versions of those stories um, for himself as well, and that he can share with other communities as an author. So in thinking about that, I wanted to share the last um, set of questions. And um, also wanted to share that this is a picture of Jason Reynolds with his mother, Isabel. This is from the Story Corpse episode that he had where he talked about how his mother was influential for him in his storytelling and how he became an author. And he also recently um, did a uh, Radiotopia podcast called My Mother Made Me, where he talks further about his relationship relationship with his mother and how he became who he is now because of that relationship. So these last three questions, how do you see yourself in relation to your family? How did your family's stories and ways of sharing stories affect your emotional well-being and how you cope with your emotions today? In what ways do you want to continue or create new stories from your family's stories? And I'll give you about five minutes to write some notes reflecting on these questions and also in connection to the previous questions from earlier.
Okay. So I hope you were able to write some responses to these questions and hopefully you can start writing your own family story inspired by Reynolds essay as well. So to end, I would also like to share some resources to think further about fictive kinship, uh, Forging Family Bonds Through Storytelling by David C. Dole, Dolehite, uh, Understanding the Impact of Fictive Kinship on Faculty and Staff Wellness by Alexia Hudson Ward from Choice 360, uh, legally Recognizing Fictive Kin Relationships, A Call for Action by Julia J. Eager from American Bar Association. If you didn't know, uh, fictive, kin, fictive kins aren't legally recognized. You have to formally adopt people. But uh, Julia J. Eager wanted to um, suggest that it be something that's legally recognized, especially um, during these times it might be of greater importance. And um, I wanted to mention two projects that are important for like intergenerational um, and community sharing, storytelling and sharing. Uh, Five Borough Story Project, uh, they do intergenerational um, story circles throughout the city. And also Queen's Memory, which is part of Queen's Library. And um, there you can share your stories about your own family members and um, community members and share that with other people in the community as well. So that is it for this uh, session of You Are Your Best Thing. And if you have any questions, feel free to um, share them in the chat. Yes, thank you so much, Sharice. Um, and as Sharice said, if you have any questions or you have any reflections, you know, we would love to hear from you and, you know, have a little discussion with our a few minutes left. Um, but, you know, I, I, I want to, you know, touch on what you were discussing today about how wellness, you know, last time we were together, we spoke about how wellness can be very like lonely and isolated and an individual process, right? And now today we're kind of branching a little bit further outside from, of ourselves mm -hmm. to our immediate support, right? Mm -hmm. Our family and our chosen family. Mm -hmm. And and it's just, it's really important for us to think about how wellness is not you fighting to get healthy. It's you working with the, your support system, working with your family, working with your friends Mm -hmm. together, right? They're helping you, you're helping them. And really, it's about this community building. And I, I really enjoy that, you know, you touched upon that. And, you know, I want to hear more of your thoughts, you know, of, of this idea of, of wellness being outside of you and as part of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think especially in the world we're living in now where we talk a lot about self-care and self-love, I think we tend to ignore how much our development of self-care and self-love comes from our interactions with other people. Mm -hmm. That community care and community love is also important. And that sometimes you learn those things from the people you are around. And if you're around a, a bunch of people who don't show you that they care about you or don't show you how to love, it's hard for you to see that in yourself. So I all, a lot of people have been um, sharing this online, but the imp importance of community care. It's not enough to just have self-care. We're social creatures. We, um, de we depend on each other to thrive. And so it's, it's important to stress that as well. Yeah, of course. And, you know, a lot of our, even our like healthcare does not recognize the importance of 
community, right? You know, you go to a doctor's appointment, it's just you and the doctor, you mm-hmm. know, you go to therapy, it's you and a therapist, mm-hmm. you know, there's group, but, you know, group is usually more about, um, you know, specific illnesses that you work together. And it's also usually post illness, right? It's the mm-hmm. maintenance stage that you're working on group. Mm -hmm. where really we can kind of incorporate community in every single step of the way, right? Mm -hmm. Community starts with understanding that the truth of your illness, right? Which is what we spoke about last week and community in the working on getting better and Mm -hmm. then the community and maintaining your health, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, Uh, Danielle said, fictive kin is essential when family narratives may not be reliable information. Yes. Or if families do not encourage storytelling. I never Mm -hmm. thought of being the co-creator in my own story. It's empowering. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you feel empowered. Um, Do you want to talk talk to that, Charisse, about how, you know, kind of spoke about the modeling before. If if our families don't model healthy, you know, storytelling, then how are we supposed to Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you, uh, Danielle. Yeah, um, especially when you come from families who, for example, um, we talk about this in like the Black community, how sometimes you have families who didn't learn to be emotionally af- affectionate in a certain way and talk about our feelings a lot. So oftentimes we kind of rely on our our friends and other people to kind of develop those emotional bonds. I've had to do that um, a lot. And so in a sense, I, I've relied on fictive kin to kind of develop myself emotionally that I didn't have growing up. And I agree, as Danielle said, that being the co-creator in your own story is empowering, that you have an agency in terms of the bonds and relationships that you have, and that your own particular view of experiences in, in your relationships is also important. Right. You're, you're no longer an object that things happen to. Mm-hmm. You become a subject where you can do the actions and change those things that are happening around you. You know, and and that's that's really important when we think about you know our health and think about what's what's happening, you know, in our in our lives. And I and the I I want to come back to the idea of like these narratives, right? Mm-hmm. And how sometimes we hear narratives that aren't reliable. Sometimes mm-hmm. we create those narratives ourselves. You know, um, I know I I've struggled with that myself of this I of this. I always used to fall into this narrative of like the worst possible outcome, mm-hmm. right? And the worst possible outcome was always going to happen, but it never happened. Mm-hmm. But just thinking that it's going to happen added so much stress and anxiety into my life. Mm-hmm. And instead of taking a step back and saying, "Wait, is this the actual is this actual reality?" You know, mm-hmm. is this fear based in reality. And often it's not. Often it's just ourselves trying to protect ourselves against what might happen. But Mm -hmm. really, you know, and this may be more of like metaphysical, but, you know, I really think everything is is working for you rather than against you. And we have to realize that first to then be able to see that and see, you know, our communities wanting us to succeed. Yeah, I definitely relate to that as someone who has anxiety. I often am like harder on myself and very critical and I'll see things as being worse than they are sometimes. And so I often rely on my friends to like help me like see a a situation properly. Like I'll think like, oh, I did terrible at this thing. And they'll be like, no, you were amazing. And I'm like, really? So yeah, like having other people to bounce off of and to help have their perspectives on things help me have a clearer mind on how I experience the world. And 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 I want to touch on something else that you talked about about how family isn't necessarily biological. Family can be anything. You can create your family, you know. And 
Um, a lot of communities, you know, one community that I'm thinking of in particular, you know, is the LGBTQ community where sometimes, you know, they don't have biological family in the sense of emotional connection. You know, they have a biological family, but it, it's, they're not necessarily in their lives. And mm. the idea of, you know, family can be anywhere, anyone, as long as they're fulfilling that bridge of helping you go from outside of yourself, right? You know, allowing you to be able to navigate the world in a safe, cushiony environment, you know? Um, and I think even if you're not, you know, in the LGBTQ community or in any of these, you know, historical communities that needed to do that, I think we all can take something from that mm -hmm. of you don't have to have, you're, you know, your mother, your father, your siblings don't have to be everything, you know? You can have different people in your life provide different aspects of family. And mm -hmm. that is valid and that's needed when thinking about these different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the danger of the nuclear family idea. It, it can end up being isolating, especially if you're in a family that is feeding you, as Danielle said, um, not reliable information, toxic information. They're abusive towards you. They're um, not supportive of you in ways that you need them to be supportive. To have other people that you can go to and rely on is extremely important and they don't have to be blood related to you. All that matters is that you have a shared understanding. You have a shared responsibility to each other and that is what makes family, not blood relation. Definitely. Um, you know, uh, I don't know if there's something else that you want to touch on. You know, I, I think that our discussion has been great. If someone else in our audience would like to, you know, share anything, um, we have about three more minutes left. Um, is there anything you want to like hit home for us, uh, Sharice? Um, not at the moment, but this conversation has been great. Thank you, Christopher. Um, okay, so seeing that um, I don't see anything coming into our chat, um, I just want to say thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Sharice, uh, for being here. Um, join us for our next Wellness Wednesdays and join us next month where Sharice will be back um, doing our next part of our series. Um, so thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone.